Um, you can find them back there. We also have uh, information about our immersive program, which is the program that you guys are taking right now. Um, yeah, I hope you guys like the cats. I'm putting, <laughs> making an effort to put more cats in everything. Um, so, I guess I'll give a really quick intro to Code Chrysalis. I know some of you guys have heard about us. Um, but for those who don't, we are a full stack software engineering boot camp in Tokyo. Uh, we have three main missions. The first one is to create engineering leaders. Uh, for us, being a good software engineer is more than just technical skills. It's also being able to communicate clearly because we work on a team. We need to be able to communicate our thoughts to uh, other team members, other developers, and non-technical people. Uh, also, flexible autonomy, because technology moves really fast. We need to be able to have the independence and autonomy to be able to pick up uh, things fast. Uh, and then empathy, because at the end of the day, we are builders. We're building technologies for other people to use, so we need to have empathy. Um, we also do a lot of outreach uh, when it comes to empowering women and getting them into the tech industry. Um, we do a lot of outreach with Women Who Code and AnitaB.org, for example. Um, and we also do a lot of community building, so getting people together to uh, provide support and build community for technologists in Japan and spread information. So we actually have three programs. Uh, there's the 12-week course that we're most known for. Um, we also have an intro to programming course and an English communication course. I'll talk a bit about the immersive. Um, our students come from a pretty diverse background. Uh, about 44% uh, of them are Japanese, and the rest are from all over the place. Uh, our class can be split up uh, generally into thirds. So about a third of our students or previous graduates uh, came from software backgrounds. So they were software engineers or they have computer science degrees. Uh, the other third are uh, what we call other engineering. Mechanical and electrical tend to be the most popular. Um, and then 36%, so the last third, tend to be people from something completely unrelated. The admissions process is a little long. Um, the first part of it is an online coding challenge to submit your application. So you have to figure out this online coding challenge uh, in order to submit your application. You have to know how to code. Um, the second part is a series of technical check-ins to see where you're currently at and where you need to be, and we help you bridge that gap. Um, and then after you pass that, you're in the program, and we give you two months' worth of what we call pre-course work. That's homework that you need to do on your own. Um, we have such a uh, high standard because we don't want people who uh, don't really know what they're getting into to uh, decide to take our course and realize two weeks into the course that they really don't like coding. Um, so we have these barriers to make sure that you know what you're getting into and that you're putting in the effort. So this is our curriculum. Um, our uh, pre-course is the stuff that our students do remotely, covers a lot of the basics, uh, Git, uh, command line, uh, some basic data structures, unit testing, things like that. Um, and then the first six weeks are focused on bringing people um, full stack, uh, computer science fundamentals, back end, front end, um, and also a lot of things that other programs don't focus on, like product management and continuous delivery. The second half of the course, which our current students are at right now, we have them do tech talks, uh, there's also a week called Polyglottal Week, which they just finished up. They have to uh, learn a new language that they've never used before, and they have to build an app with it in one week. Um, to cap it off, we have senior projects, the capstone. Their final uh, three weeks are focused on creating this final project. Um, and then throughout the last six weeks, we help them with figuring out what they want to do after they graduate. So we help them with everything from resume support to uh, technical and non-technical interview training, things like that. And that typically leads to pretty strong outcomes. So um, our students uh, have gotten some job offers from these companies. Um, and on average, they make much more than, than what they would make uh, in the market uh, without us. And we work with some really cool companies uh, like RGA and Pivotal uh, and Rakuten. And uh, we didn't think that we'd be coming to Japan to start an English school, but we realized that there was such a need for, for English here. 
Uh, so this class focuses completely on English communication. Um, it's only eight weeks and it's very much focused on outcomes. Um, huge focus on being able to say what's on your mind. Huge focus on confidence. And we also have a beginner course. If you're interested in any of these, you can find the information online. There's also flyers back there. Um, and we do also a lot of events. So these are the rest of the events that we have for December. Um, it's a mix of English speaking events and then also tech events. So there's stuff for beginners um, as well as people who are a little bit more advanced. Um, and I would like to invite you all to our graduating classes demo day. It's going to be on Thursday, December 27th. It starts at 7.30 and it'll be here. So I'm happy to answer any questions. We've got a few alums sitting in the crowd as well. Um, and uh, you can add us on all the social media things. So uh, without further ado, welcome to Big Mini Conf. Um, as people are streaming in for later talks, please help them find seats. Um, we say this a lot, uh, we make you comfortable with being uncomfortable and having to speak in front of an audience about a tech topic that you embarked on only a month ago is probably one of the most uncomfortable situations that you could be in. So I hope that you will have massive respect for our students. Um, these are tech topics that they have chosen on their own with very little intervention from the instructors. Um, and these were topics that they chose, uh, that they were really interested in, and I'm really excited to see what they're going to be saying. Um, so first up, we have Sora with Build Your API in 30 Minutes. opportunity today and uh, I'm really happy to meet you all and uh, thank you for attention. Um, I will, my talk will be 45 minutes as been um, introduced and uh, I have chosen this topic, build your API in 30 minutes. And first let me talk about, uh, introduce about myself. Um, I am uh, Sora and uh, I'm Japanese but uh, um, I spent um, my youth um, uh, 13 years in Germany and uh, UK and uh, Austria, so that's why I speak a bit uh, English. Um, and uh, back then, um, that was eight years ago, I was actually uh, working as a professional um, dancer. Um, now I am working as a product manager in an um, advertising company and uh, I am a product manager and I want to introduce this uh, mind map of the uh, product manager. Uh, as you can see, the 40% of the mind of product manager is about communication. And uh, the communication, uh, the kind of communication I have to spend a lot of time is mostly the mediating the business user, um, standing between business user and uh, um, engineers. So I have to um, coordinate all those uh, business requirements and uh, convert it in, into the uh, technical, um, technical decision makings. And I have to also make uh, decisions for the priorities. And uh, now I want to talk a little about why I have cho chosen this topic about um, API. Sorry, I'm using my mobile phone uh, not to check my emails. It's, uh, it's my speaker's note, sorry. Um, yeah, so I have this, uh, chosen this topic. It's a um, very simple reason. Um, I myself um, had very much difficulty to understand what API does and uh, is for years. And, uh, but unfortunately, unfortunately, I had to use this word API for uh, quite a lot of reasons in my job. So it was really hard for me to use these words without um, having in my mind a uh, corner of my mind that uh, I don't know too much about it. And um, actually, um, I met this uh, guy called uh, Daniel Schiffman. He's a YouTuber. 
Um, I didn't meet him in person, but uh, I really like his contents, and, and he is uh, um, he has his con in his contents um, and introducing uh, this concept of building your API. And I watched his contents, and uh, I was really amazed um, how easily you can actually build one. So today, hopefully, I can also introduce you and inspire you uh, to create one for yourself. So now I want to um, um, talk about um, the job I do. Um, so um, I first heard of API was four years ago. And uh, in our company, we have the backend system uh, to handle all those uh, um, yeah, um, data between uh, all those publishers. So it's a, it's a back and forth uh, communication between uh, many different uh, publishers. So we have this back end system in our company. And uh, we have service portal. Um, and in the service portal, uh, the service team is creating, generating a, um, ads campaign data and then that will be pushed to the older publishers and uh, once it's been um, broadcasted on the, each single publisher it returns all the data back to our backend system and then we have all those ERP and CRM things uh, connected to backend and uh, we also provide a client portal and uh, provide also, uh, all sorts of ad advertising related information through our backend. So a company like mine is called uh, demand side, uh, um, is providing a demand side pro uh, platform. Um, what it means is a mediating between the publisher and the advertiser. So we are standing in a point as uh, we are providing a system for the advertiser and there is multiple publisher and we have to mediate uh, between them. Um, and this is the, it's not the cows map, it's a, this is the marketing technologies landscape for uh, 2018. So I will zoom in for you. Um, but I guess that this will not help you much. Um, so with this, I wanted to just uh, talk about uh, what kind of market I am in. And uh, uh, this uh, DSP business is cannot uh, go without API. So all about connectivity and uh, um, yeah, real-time con connectivity matters a lot. So go back to today's ad agenda. So I would like to talk here and there um, about um, what is about uh, what is API and all those introductional uh, information about API, uh, and uh, also uh, like my title represent uh, steps to build a basic API. And uh, the expected audience for today, um, I have to say that all are welcome today. Uh, but I specifically designed this talk for non-engineers like myself. Um, because I would like to introduce how easy you can actually build one. And uh, I would like to also help um, them to understand more about what API does. So what is API? So this stands, as you may know already, Application Programming Interface. And I personally think this is a very difficult concept to understand because um, if you are not a programmer, you wouldn't be able to see it. So the interface, um, the word interface was uh, one, one part of API and uh, the interface uh, designed for human is such as like mouse or keyboard or like a one website portal. But the API is for the... Um, programs or like a device or software to um, talk to each other. So not, for desi not designed for humans. So I think that's one of the, uh, the um, most important reasons why I had a difficulty to understand it. 
So I would like to introduce um, this uh, diagram. So this is one API network structure. Um, I guess this can look like this. Um, so there is a ba database um, on the right side of you, and uh, there is API, um, and API handles all the requests from the uh, client app. And uh, I want to introduce that today you will stand in this point, so you will be the provider of API. And uh, because um, I think it's, it is always good to have the case study, so I hope you like sake. I personally love sake, so I would like to use this uh, um, sake example today. So I, as an API provider, I would like to create an unofficial sake library. This is the context. And now I want to invite you all to think about the business needs here. And uh, to talk about business needs, I think uh, we have to think about what kind of data we can provide. Today I want to go simple, so I have these four kinds of data. Name, uh, so it's a name of sake, and uh, maker is of course the um, manufacturer name, um, and the region where it's been produced, and the website URL. And then I would think uh, what kind of um, clients are, are interested, interested in to connect to my API, Sake library, to talk to uh, my database and get the information. Well, uh, with um, my imagination, I would say buyers or liquor store owners or restaurant owners who has their app. And then I would say I definitely would like to cover international um, app owners. So um, we don't have to know too much about who's going to be using our API. Um, because one of the great things about public API is that, uh, that all sorts of client apps want to use your um, API. And uh, they can create all sorts of um, interesting apps. So this is one of the motivation you can have as a provider. So now I want to talk about the RESTful API, I, um, the one uh, API architecture I want to introduce. Um, so this is just a joke. So it is not about uh, being uh, RESTful. Um, yeah. So RESTful stands for, uh, the REST stands for Representational State Transfer and uh, it's been uh, founded by this guy called uh, the, sorry, um, Fieldman, I guess, I remember. Yeah, Roy Fielding is the guy. Uh, he is the American computer scientist and who has, happens to be also the principal also of HTTP. So I want to introduce the an another uh, visual image about API. So API is something which wraps around the database and handles all kinds of operational requests. And the REST API methods versus uh, database operation can be mapped like this. So you have get method to ask for the um, sake data for this context and post request for, uh, for the purpose of creating a data in a database. So adding a data, new sake data in a database. And put is something what you can use to update some part of the existing data. And delete is of course delete the data. Yeah. So um, yeah, again with the, um, some another um, image. So request sends from the client. I use the word client and server a lot. Uh, it's been used to uh, talk about API quite a lot. So I will use this word. So client app will send a request to my uh, sake library. And then my sake library will respond with uh, sake data. And with the post request, it's also being requested from um, 
someone else uh, to create a new sake data to my sake library. And my database will respond, my API will respond with, uh, um, yeah, so your data is saved. So now I want to walk through the code I created. So my code covers um, how to create a web server and also how to create, a, how to build an API. So the step one, creating a web server. Um, so in my project folder, I create a file uh, named server.js and then I start to um, use the um, framework called Express. I will talk a little about it later. You don't have to worry too much about it, but this is kind of the tool you can import and uh, initiate and use it. And with this uh, code, I initiate um, and assign to the variable app. So this clean bit of the code is uh, my comments. Um, and the last bit is about um, um, creating a port, defining a port. And uh, I, if I start the website uh, web server, I want to get some sort of like nice uh, message. So I created this function to console log that your web server is on, in where. Yeah. So I want to note. Uh, I want to emphasize that this little amount of code is actually uh, enough to create a web server. I think this is uh, amazing. And this is provided by um, Express uh, module. Um, so all the heavy lifting is done by this uh, module Express. And the Express I used to create a web server now. And I can also create, um, build an API using Express. And uh, Express works on Node. And Express is the framework and used by all sorts of famous companies. So it's very relevant technology. So now I want to create an API. So this is the glamour you have to respect if you use Express. So as you can see, um, we, have used, um, we have initiated the app variable and there is a function uh, the methods, so methods we talked about is get, post, and put, and delete. All those things can be um, used as a function. And the first argument is the path, and the second argument is hunter. So this is the glamour you have to respect if you use uh, Express. And now I want to start with um, defining a get method to return all sake data I have in a sake library. So this is the function which defines this. So like I explained it before, so app.get parentheses, this is the function provided by uh, module express. And the first argument here is a path you have to use to um, get uh, when you use the get method. Um, so now, um, so this bit of the path, I designed it. Uh, so this is slash API slash sakes. So now I want to talk a little about uh, how to design the path. So go back to the topic, topic of REST API. So representational state transfer. So the state means basically the data. So this uh, path, with this path, you, ha you have to uh, represent what kind of data you are returning. Um, so this is a bad example you could have. So this is the action uh, words, meaning verb. Uh, so search or show, all those things are included in a path. That's a bad example of RESTful API. Um, and this is the good example uh, 
like I showed, slash API slash sake. So we can kind of um, we can guess that the sake data will be returned. So you um, the path or URI you design should represent the data and not the action. Why? Is because um, this get this is this should be the only one action um, action which represent uh, uh, API. So the second argument is the callback function. If you don't know what is callback function, don't worry too much about it. This is one function. So right now I name as a do something. And this do something function, the second argument of the uh, get method, uh, that can take request and response. So this is also the glamour of express. So uh, suppose, uh, so for now, I wanna, um, I wanna define this function with uh, responding with a dummy string that uh, get request is received. And now I want to show the little demo. So you start the server with node server.js. So server.js is the file name. So you start uh, with this, and uh, this is showing a little uh, code I just uh, provided. So it says, hi Sora, your web server is ready, go to this address. Um, sorry. <laughs> so this is the web server address, and then um, API, Yes, I didn't do it with uh, preparation, so it's showing already, but uh, um, actually I can go to this site. So uh, this is showing just the static data in the beginning, and if I change the UR, uh, URL the, like this, then it shows get request is uh, received words. So this is the little test to confirm what we have been looking at, that it is um, acting as uh, we expected. So now I want to uh, invite us to define the do something uh, function so that we can return all sorts of uh, the, all the data in a SACI library. So this is the uh, code which will return the data um, to the client apps. So I'm using the uh, FS module to uh, read the data from the separated file, JSON file, and assign it to uh, variable data. And uh, response.send is provided, it's a, a provided uh, method uh, from the express, and uh, it's taking a variable data. You don't have to worry too much about it, but uh, usually, we, if you want to create an um, API, you have to have a database. But for the purpose of the demo, I didn't create the uh, website, uh, the, sorry, the database. I just used the um, JSON file, separated JSON file. So now I want to test again. So this is the function we have been talking about. And this is the amount of code which returns the data from the separated <coughs> file. Um, so this is the file has data. Yeah. So now I have to restart my web server and then page and uh, for the purpose of showing what's happening um, so this is go back to my static page and uh, yeah so now I use the same URL as before but now I, it's showing the sake data from my library yeah. 
So to review the process again, um, so the get method is ask, allowing client apps to ask, like, can you give me the data for sake x? So this is the kind of situation which we have to expect if you design an API. Uh, so before we have been returning all sake data, but uh, as an owner of uh, sake library uh, API, I want to also um, answer to that kind of request as well. So this is asking a specific sake data x, and this is also asking a, a specific uh, data, um, and match to the specific uh, um, manufacturer. And uh, meantime, I want to also facilitate a request like this, that can you give me all kinds of data you have? So now I want to facilitate three kinds of, uh, three kinds of requests. So now I have to change my handle method, uh, so callback uh, function, do something, to respond to this. Um, so again, to go walk through the process I have uh, talked about. So the request one specific sake and the sake provided by a specific maker and the request in all sake. So I want to, I want to facilitate three kinds of requests. So uh, now I, I want to introduce the new um, new grammar, uh, the new rules. Um, so this is the three kinds of requests we we can expect um, clients to throw to um, the API I designed. So you see this is the, uh, the question mark is added to the path I designed. So adding the question mark and then name equals sake name and maker equals sake maker. So I'm just uh, having a, the orange text is just a dummy information. But if clients is giving this something after question mark, then I can respond with the specific data. So for that, I would like to finally rename my function from do something to query records, because this is more much to the, um, what I want to do. So since this function will contain quite a little uh, amount of code, I created another file. So I define in a function and then export into another file. So this is topic is explaining about this. So this fun function takes re request and response over there. So I'm a bit lazy, so I'm just using a leak and a rest uh, to represent the request and response as an argument. And within this function, this, this is a huge function, so I just introduced the, uh, the top part of it. So in a top bit, I'm assigning the name uh, the variable name, defining the name, and uh, get the information from the request object. And the second bit is um, creating a, another variable maker and uh, passing the information from the request. So what is request.query does? So request is the object, and the query is the data which is passed from the client app. So client is the left, and the cl cl clients, if clients request with URL like this, then respond with sake data with the top case, and the second type of request, I want to respond with maker's information, uh, the sake information uh, produced by uh, common maker. So now I have to introduce a little bit longer conditions because I want to handle three types of requests with one function. So that's why I have a condition um, called. So the case one is I want to return the data um, for the clients who are asking for the specific sake data. So if the sake name is not undefined, then I will go through my data and looking for the match and um, store the data into result. And case two, 
is if client request contains the maker information, and then I go through uh, the data in my sake library, and if there is any match, then I want to return. The third one is uh, if there is no name given, no makers given, then I want to re return everything. And the last statement of response dot um, send uh, parentheses. So this is returning the result to the client. Up. So this is the end of function of query reports. So now I want to test it again. So I want to disable the function I was using. And then I will enable the function I want to use now. And uh, I want to restart my server. Start the server and then, um, okay. So go back to my static um, contents and then start with um, so API slash sakes with question mark and <coughs> name equals to. Um, Say, um, say Liki. So this is the name of sake, just an example. So if I, um, if client uh, request with this condition, then I will return the matched data. So only a single information matched. So if I changed this request with um, sake makers information, then it returns the match data um, produced by this uh, this sake maker. And then, if I request without detailed information, then it returns again also all kinds of data. So as you can see, I designed one function to handle three types of uh, requests. So to review my get request, so the client app says, give me data. And then my sake library backend will return with, here you are. So now I want to um, also define the post request API. And for this scenario, so the left, uh, the right, side of uh, image, this is the sake maker. So sake maker will list, uh, ask me that please add new data. But for this scenario, I was thinking since the sake uh, maker is not like a, a beer uh, manufacturer produces so many different kind of brands um, in single months or something like this. So. Uh, that's why I want to provide a little uh, front end and allows um, sake makers to log into my front end and uh, give the new sake data. So this is the kind of scenario I imagine. So request to add a new sake data, then my uh, front end will respond that, okay, my back end will look after you. So this is the image I want to um, I want to make, and uh, now I want to create a post method to add a new record. So, with this code, what I'm doing is uh, I'm importing uh, um, another module called body person, and uh, with this amount of code, I am setting up and enabling uh, body person. 
So I don't want to go in the details about what body pressure is doing because I myself don't understand the details about it. But uh, the basically what it does is um, get the passing the data from client to server so that server can handle those data. So now I want to define the POST API. Now you can realize that we, we are seeing the same kinds of glamour here. So it's very similar to get uh, method. So app.post instead of uh, app.get. And then parentheses takes two arguments and it looks also similar, has path and a function. And function now is create record function. And now I want to define a create record function, which takes again the two kinds of um, arguments. One is request, the another, uh, sorry, the one is request and another is response, what you can see here. So takes two types of information and uh, do something in the middle. So what I define here in the middle of the function is that um, I read the file from the, my separated JSON data and assign to the variable data. And then I add the new data, which is passed from the client app with this little code. So getting the data with spread, uh, spread operator and uh, request of body will pass the, um, adding the new data. And then I will overwrite the, my JSON file with uh, stored in uh, sarcx.json and then respond with it. So now I want to spend a little time uh, talking about this request.body. So what is request.body? So request is the object and body contains uh, information passed from the uh, sake makers. So it looks like this. So if sake um, cli the clients uh, who are visiting my uh, little front end looks like a web form and then inputting all sorts of data, then my front end will generate those data and pass to the back end. So now I want to test my code again. Um, so usually I have to restart the server, but uh, it's now on, so I just go with it. Um, so um, I was till now I was playing around with this uh, uh, browser, but for the post uh, request, unfortunately I can't use this um, since if I manipulate the URL, uh, URL this is all considered to be get uh, request. So now I use the um, API, REST API testing tool calls Insomnia. There's all kinds of testing tools, uh, but uh, I would like to use this one because it's very simple to use. So I create post testing request. And then, um, I give the uh, URL, um, the path I defined, and then uh, in a body, I want to use the JSON data, and I want to post here. So I will post. Um, so right now I'm representing the, the client uh, apps at uh, some point. So client app will um, specify the um, path and the JSON data and send it. And it will respond with the added data. And now I want to check with uh, get method if I have the data. So I want to check. Yeah. 
Sorry, I was testing a lot, so I have like three kinds of duplicated data. So it's responding with the data in, stored in a database. So go back to my little um, visual to represent the API. So again, the API wraps around the database and handle all kinds of operations here. And we covered reading part with get method and uh, creating part with post method. So that's, um, that was my coding part. And uh, now I want to introduce that there is another API architecture today. <coughs> so one of the important um, API architecture is GraphQL, which is uh, introduced uh, from Facebook. Uh, since 2015, and uh, this is um, provided to and uh, said to be uh, resolving some sort of uh, some REST APIs problem. And these are the companies who are using this API. And the next API I want to introduce is GRPC. It's provided from uh, Google, and. Uh, RPC represents remote procedure call and introduced in 2015 again. Um, don't worry about G bit. Um, for the each release, it means something else like a good or a, a gross, um, something. Yeah, it's been stated in a GitHub, so if you're interested. And these technologies are now used with this com uh, different companies. And uh, this uh, GRPC is supposed to be also resolving some of the REST APIs problem. So again, to re remind you, my target for today was um, I want to motivate you to build your, your API. So I have my GitHub account, and I created uh, um, my API uh, project for you so that uh, you can uh, start building your API. I'm also introducing uh, my favorite uh, uh, YouTuber here. So in a README, I explain the details about um, process you have to take for the beginners. Um, if you are confident, of course, um, feel free to create uh, one without my repository, but uh, if you are it's, uh, if it is first time for you, then I definitely will suggest you to use mine. And uh, you have to uh, install Node. Um, so, um, yeah. And uh, there is a um, package manager. Um, you have to install. You have to install the package manager. And uh, in a package.json file, I stated all kinds of module you can use. So please use um, package manager to um, install all the uh, relevant modules in your PC. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, don't worry too much. Um, README will explain you. So thank you for listening to my talk. Uh, it was uh, long, so I hope you enjoyed. Um, so this is the um, yeah, QR code for my GitHub account and my project GitHub account. So if you are interested, please access. Thank you so much. is basically the um, helping that uh, the REST API is uh, sometimes responding with the data which is not even asked. So it's, um, it's providing uh, um, some information which is not asked and uh, 
I um, use example to reply for the three kinds of requests, but it's not covering all, co uh, all kinds of complex queries. So GraphQL, GraphQL is actually uh, very good for the very detailed query. So if you uh, use GraphQL, the exact data will be responding. Yeah. And there's all kinds of other good, uh, uh, the, yeah, good side of GraphQL. You can find all sorts of contents in YouTube, so I definitely will recommend you to look at it. I also would like to study more. And uh, GRPC is um, um, mostly about the speed, uh, speed of response. Um, and the Google is using, I heard that Google is using uh, for the internal microservice to be connected to each other and talk to each other. So it's all about speed and also um, helps to uh, convert to all kinds of data, uh, all kinds of uh, programming language. So this is just a little essence of it. So you definitely um, have to uh, see the other contents to cover your knowledge. Yeah, and it's uh, really worse technology to discover, I guess. And uh, I'm also very keen to study about it because my company is having now uh, also all kinds of programs with API. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Awesome. Yay, another round of applause. Okay, sorry about the messy start. Hi, my name is Charles. I'll be giving a talk about introduction to machine learning with JavaScript. So we kind of talked about it. Only one person has experience with machine learning. Are you a data scientist? Uh, no, I'm a teaching assistant. Teaching assistant, that's right. Specializing in machine learning supervision. Okay, cool. Um, feel free to correct me later. Okay? <laughs> but yeah, um, so a bit about myself. My name is Charles. I'm from America. Uh, I was born there, raised in Southern California and in Shanghai. Uh, I went to school as an electrical engineer for four years, and then I went and worked as an application engineer for servers. I realized it wasn't for me, had an interest in software, and then decided, you know what, I might as well take a leap of faith and go do a software boot camp that's called Chrysalis. So that's me. Um, you guys already know, I'm not a data scientist. I don't know much about the world, but I'm very interested in it, and I like to dabble in my free time. So what I'm presenting today is stuff that I learned while pursuing a project, and wanted to share to anyone else that might want to put, get their foot in the door also. So before we get into anything, what is machine learning? Does anyone have a guess? There's a lot of buzzwords out there, machine learning, AI. Does anyone want to go ahead? M machine learning is kind of process that can enable like machine to think as a human, and, like okay. like three layer from machine learning, deep learning to real AI. Okay, yeah, that that's basically right. AI, machine learning, and deep learning get really mixed up together. But um, if you want to get the most like, how do I say this? The most concrete uh, definition of machine learning you get Arthur Samuel. Besides having two first names, Arthur Samuel was the one who coined the term machine learning. So basically, he said machine learning is the ability to, for a machine to learn without being explicitly programmed. So when you want a machine to learn something, instead of doing infinite amounts of if statements, you just make it learn it once, feed it data, then it will know it forever. That's what machine learning is, according to Arthur at least. So, why do we want machines to learn? Haven't you watched The Matrix, Charles? Haven't you seen Ultron? Haven't you heard Elon Musk talk about how machine learning AI could cause the end of the world? Well, I'm not saying that's not true, but I'm saying there's a lot of benefits from machine learning. This won't happen for at least 50 years or something. Um, but the benefits from machine learning, you probably all already know some things that have machine learning implemented. One example is Google Home. How many of you guys have a Google Home? Felix right there in the very back. <laughs> so only Felix has a Google Home. But you guys know what it is at least, I'm pretty sure. You speak to the device, it understands what you're saying, and it responds with whatever you want, your answer. You have Snapchat. Everyone uses Snapchat. You cannot, oh, everyone uses Snapchat or Instagram. I know that's a fact. There's image recognition. It checks your face, sees what's a face, puts a filter you want. That's image recognition machine learning. Google recommendations. These can be annoying too sometimes when you see ads all over. That's because Google gets the data you get, puts it in a machine learning, 
protocol, and then it sends you recommendations based off of your activity, machine learning and daily life. These are things that more people know about, but here's some examples that you may not know about. So this is a picture of a machine learning tool, a thermographic eye image, that scans for dry eye disease. So there are a lot of image recognition technologies out there that kind of look at your eyes and see, okay, do you have diabetic retinopathy? Do you have dry eye disease? Basically, it's a cool way of using technology to get data without being invasive or painful. The way to do it before this was invented was really uncomfortable. So this is a huge step up. Then there's cancer. Um, a lot of machine learning is, like the previous example, used to find uh, diseases, to see what could possibly be wrong with this person. So, in medical sense. But basically, they are trained a model to detect cancer from a group of cells, and they can send you feedback, oh, this looks like it's a cancerous cell. Another example is machine learning can be used to predict issues in uh, disease, in, um, like epidemic issues. So there was a case, I didn't put it up here, there's a case where there's a machine learning model. It was able to detect an Ebola outbreak nine years before it actually happened, which I thought was insane. Um, the fact that something, a machine could do something humans couldn't do is just really cool. And this is a little more fun. This is someone on Medium, he made a little machine learning model where he played Mortal Kombat with his actual body. Um, I can send you a link to that if you guys are interested. So those are the applications of machine learning. I hope that got you guys interested in this talk because I believe it's really cool. Um, these are a few tools that people use that I personally looked into, TensorFlow, Keras, and Kaggle. Kaggle is like a website where kind of like, I guess, GitHub-ish where you post a lot of machine learning things. There's a lot of challenges out there. But TensorFlow and Keras, they're more like libraries that you can use. We'll be talking mostly about TensorFlow today. So TensorFlow, what is it? TensorFlow is open source. Oh, sorry. TensorFlow was famous because of this one TV show that got on the air. Can anyone guess what this is? It's not Crazy Rich Asians. Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, you're correct. So this is Silicon Valley. And in Silicon Valley, this character created an app called Not Hot Dog. It had one purpose and one purpose only. It would scan something and tell you if it was a hot dog or if it wasn't a hot dog. <laughs> this app was used, created using TensorFlow. <coughs> so what is TensorFlow? <coughs> Open source library. Anyone can go and download it. It creates structures that use tensors. We'll talk more about that later. Um, it's like a great structure for seeing how data flows. We'll be talking about that in like future slides. You'll get sick of tensors. Um, it allows for simple algorithm use. The best thing about TensorFlow is the abstraction. It makes it so that you don't have to know too much about algorithms, but still use them. Which for any basic programmer like me, that's, that's great. I don't have to know all the, the nitty gritty details. It's simple to implement neural networks, which you will hear a lot about from my talk and Brendan's talk later. So that was TensorFlow. This is TensorFlow.js. So there was a program called DeepLearn.js a while back. And that team went to Google and created something called TensorFlow.js. It got um, many of the features that TensorFlow and Keras had and implemented it in JavaScript. The benefits of using this is that it's browser-based, so you can access a lot of the JavaScript API with this. Allows access of IOs, your phone camera, your phone microphone, your gyroscope, anything can be accessed using TensorFlow.js. Then the debugging capabilities, real-time input and output, and what I think is the most important is that user data stays on their machine. What that means is instead of processing GPU power from your server, the consumer, not the consumer, the user uses their GPU power, which I think is a huge benefit. Some people say TensorFlow.js is inferior to TensorFlow Python, but this was shown in a talk recently showing that the, the performance of both is very similar. So if you're unsure about using TensorFlow.js and don't know Python, go ahead and try it out. So that was TensorFlow. Let's talk about some details. What is a tensor and how to use it? Since there's not that many machine learning people here, uh, this is what a tensor is. Really simple. I'm just kidding. This is really bad. I don't know what this means. Um, <laughs> what a, I have a better representation for you guys here. Much simpler, easy to understand. So the pug is the tensor. I'll go over each one individually. So a scalar, we all know what a scalar is, right? A number. 
something small, like a single digit, so five, um, you represent this as like an integer or a float or something. A vector right here is a list, a group of scalars. So think of this as an array. A matrix right here is a n by n array. So it's, let's say this one right here is a two dimensional array. And when you go further than that, you have a stack of layers of these arrays. You have a tensor. So that is in simple terms what a tensor is for programming at least, at least for this tutorial. If you want to get your foot in more, then you probably need to do a bit more research. So why do we use tensors? Data nowadays gets really multi-dimensional. The more data we have and interaction with the real world, the more we have to get more data. So right here we have examples of videos and images. Looking specifically at the images, you see that there's a red, green, and blue component. When you have an image, you can't just have it as one layer. It has three layers of red, green, and blue so you don't miss out on, on the information. That's where tensors are very useful because you can get information from all layers very easily. Let me show you a really quick demo. It's a little crude. Uh, like we mentioned, this was a one week project, but I think it turned out okay. So this is really simple. This is what we'll, I'll be showing you how to make today. This is a digit recognizer. So normally when you input something like a zero to nine, the machine knows what it is, but what if you draw it? Then the machine will be like, what? <laughs> The machine will have no idea what it is. Can someone give me their favorite number? Five. Five. <laughs> you can go next. Sorry, excuse my horrible drawing skills. It's probably not gonna read. Cool, so that's a five. Eight. Eight. Oh God. Oh, it's definitely not gonna know that. Yeah, it's gonna be another time. There's a reason why I make coding book yeah. not art. <laughs> so basically, you can draw numbers and it will recognize it, which isn't that cool. A kid will go on the internet and be like, wow, this is neat, and then move on. But the thing is, this is machine learning, the hello world of the machine learning world. So let me go back to the presentation. OK, that was the demo. You'll be learning how to make that. So how is that? Um, program able to determine what my input was? How was it able to see what it is? Let's go use human vision as an example. Can someone in the audience tell me what they see in this picture? Brent. It's a kid. It's a kid. Okay, what is the kid doing? He's happy, he's jumping. Okay, he's jumping, he's happy, he's looking at the cake. So the reason why we can see that is because humans have an incredibly great anatomy system where we can look at an object process it, and memorize it instantly. Machines can't do that. What they see is raw data. So how are we going to get raw data to know this, what this kid is doing? We can't, unless we use something called neural networks, which is what um, people use based off of uh, animals' visual cortex. So this is what we're using today. It's a convolutional neural network. It's a little complicated just looking at it like this. We'll, we'll go over it one by one. Um, before I talk about what the convolutional neural network is, let's get into some code. So this is TensorFlow.js. All the code I'll be showing you guys today was from their website. So if you want to go back and revisit it, please go check it out. First you just you, uh, add it with your package manager, then you import it into a file you want to use. Next you import a model. This is called a sequential model. You, <laughs> you get this from TensorFlow's main website. A sequential model is a model that lets you add layers one by one. Think of it as synchronous programming versus asynchronous programming. So you will get it layer by layer by layer instead of having it all over the place like this model right here. Next, we add layers to the model. So layers, we add the layers one by one because our model will have inputs that go through each layer individually. So this is the code for the first layer. Um, don't worry about it too much, just giving you guys a, sh uh, a little Sneak peek, model.add is the main function we're using. We have a model set already. We're going to add something to it. What's inside of it, I'll explain really soon. Before that, what is convolution? You're saying that a lot, Charles. It's convolutional neural network. What does convolution mean? Convolution is an engineering math term where you add two things. It can be anything. This example is a signal right here. So you have these two signals right here. And what you do is you get an instance of each one, you compare them, you, you kind of add them together at five different points in different positions. When you add them together, 
you get the output and put it in that one position. It sounds really complicated right now, but it will be a little more clear with an actual example. So why do we need convolution? We use convolution to get features from our image. So convolutional layers have filters inside of them. Each filter gets a specific feature from the input. So in this case, we have a seven. These four are all different filters. This one detects the top edge, left edge, bottom edge, and right edge. This is really horrible image quality, but you can see the little tint of white right here. That is basically what the, what the edges are. This one detects the white right on the top. So each filter detects a different feature in your input. We're gonna go over that one by one with a real time example. This is the same seven input you had. The input we have, the filter we're using, and the end result. So the filter right here is, say, it detects a feature in edge. If you're looking for birds, it detects feathers. If it's looking for dogs, it detects fur, basically. So we take that filter, put it to the position on zero, zero, the top left position. We get the dot product, which you don't have to know about. Some math thing is happening right here. You get the dot product of that, and you push it into one of the new uh, indices of the resulting convolutional matrix. Once you do that, you shift it by one or whatever, the, uh, whatever stride you want it to be. So you shift it by a certain amount, and you keep doing it over and over again until it gets to the very end. So you're getting this input filter, input layer, putting a filter on it, one by one by one by one, and getting all of these results to the very end. So why would you need to do that? Because you want to get results, like I showed you with, uh, one second, these edges. You want to be able to get these features. You, it looks tedious, but you have to do that to get as many features as you can. So once we get that down, we know, okay, now we know we're adding something to the model. We're adding a layer, and the layer is this. What are these parameters, Charles? I have no idea what this parameter is. This is the input shape. First one, very simple, 28 by 28 by 1. We're only using this input shape because this is what the data set we're training our model with requires, a 28 by 28 pixel with a depth of 1. So that means there's only one uh, layer in the tensor. The next thing we have is kernel size. This is how big we want our filter to be. So filter size of 5, kernel size of 5 is a 5 by 5 filter. And Filters is how many filters we're putting in this layer, and strides is how many pixels it moves after each one. Next thing we're going to talk about is activation function. This is where I might lose some of you guys. It's a function you put after your layer is done. So once you're done getting it through the layer, you put an activation function on it. So most of this is used. It's used to include nonlinearity into the model, which makes no sense if you say it like that. But not, what, what you really need to know about activation function is that it manipulates the data to make it easier to work with. An example of that. We have this filter right here. An act, the activation function we're using, RELU, has one purpose. It's to get rid of all of the negative numbers and make them zero. So it's just like a good example is like airport security. You reach a new destination, you go through airport security real quick to make sure he's not a terrorist. It's basically that, making sure there's no negative numbers here and making it easier to work with for the next few steps. So that's activation, uh, activation function. The next one is kernel initialization. You don't need to know this. This is too complicated for introduction. Just use variance scaling if you are uh, attempting this by yourself. That was convolution. Hopefully you guys are still with me. Um, this is the input. You get this new convolutional layer. Once that's done, we go on to the next step called pooling. So the pooling step has one purpose, is to decrease the size of your huge convolutional layer. So you get a new model.add and you add another layer. This one's max pooling. I'm gonna show you another real time example of this. So for this one, we have the huge convolutional layer and the output. We have a predefined pool size and a stride size. So what we're going to do with the pool size, a 2 by 2 array, we look inside of it and see what the max value is. For this, they're all zeros. But if you go here, this one will be 0.72. So we get zeros, push that value into here, and repeat over and over again until the very end. Same process, just different outcome. 
So what we're trying to do is shrink it because when you shrink the size, it makes it easier to process. And when you're looking for a specific number, it introduces inconsistencies, which makes it so your, um, your model can detect better. So back at this again. Um, again, this is the model.add. We add a new layer. And we put in the parameters of the size of the layer and how many strides it goes. That was pooling. We're going to do that one more time. So we want to repeat this process a few times because the more times you do it, the more features you're detecting, the more efficient your system becomes. The deeper you get into a neural network, the more things you can detect. Eventually, you can just detect a, a full dog if you go deep enough. So this is the same exact thing as before. Hopefully, uh, you guys can follow along with this. Let's go over one by one again just for review sake. Model.add, two different ones. First one, we add the convolutional layer. We define the kernel size of five, so a five by five filter. Eight 16 filters, each with one stride, so it moves one pixel at a time. Activation function of REOU, it gets rid of the negatives and turns them into zeros, and don't worry about this. Model.add max pooling. So we have a two by two filter that goes through everything by strides of two, and it turns it smaller. So that's what we did right here. The next thing and the last thing for making our model is the fully connected layer. So the purpose of this is we get our pool layers and we turn them into classes. You have no use of these tensors in, real world, in the real world situation. Instead you want classes like, oh, this is a dog, this is a bird. So that's what this method is for. You get all your data and turn it into presentable code. So first thing we do is we flatten it. This is just convention. You want to flatten it to a 1D array instead of a 3D array so that when you add in your, um, your fully connected layer, you are able to make it so that it can distinguish what is what and turn it into classes. So first off, we do that. Then we, flat, we add in the dense layer, which is TensorFlow's way of saying fully connected layer. Then we define the units, which is how many classes we want. We have uh, numbers from 0 to 9, right? So that's 10 classes that we personally need. So we define 10 classes right here that we want. Ignore this part again. Then the activation function this time is soft max. So before it got rid of these negatives and made them zeros, right? All this one does is it combines all of them so that if you add them together, it equals one. This is really useful if you want to get percentages from, say, uh, you want to get like, how do I say this? If you add the sums up to one, that means every individual value will be a percentage, especially for our case of 10. Um, let me see if I can find an example. This is what's going on right here. You get the six, it goes through all the tensors, and comes out with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Hopefully that makes a little more sense. And e when you add these up together, it equals one. So if I have a value right, um, like right here, dog is, Oh, cat is 0 0.04 because it's 4% accurate, and that is thanks to the softmax function. Uh, that's all you need to know about that. But, so that was setting up the convolutional neural network. Congratulations, that wasn't easy. Hopefully you guys are still with me. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is how to train the network. So we're training the network now. What we did just now is we set it up so when you have an input, it goes through that model. Now we need to train it with actual data. So this is what we're using. It's called the MNIST data set. It's a, a series of images that have handwritten in, uh, digit inputs with the label of the correct answer. So there's about like 7,000 or more images in there. So a lot of the data scientists use this to train their Hello World machines. So when we're training these, we need two things. One is an optimizer and another is called the loss function. I'll go over that a bit long. So what is loss? Anyone here has taken a math, fact, math class knows what error and loss is. So right here, this is the actual data, these little dots. And this is a perceived data right here. This is what the machine thinks it is. All these arrows right here is the error of, basically how do I say this? So this is what the difference between the actual value and the, the output value. The machine thinks it's this, it's actually this. What's in between it is the loss. Right here, has, this has a smaller loss function than this one because this is more accurate, basically. So the more loss you have, the less accurate your model is. So for instance, why we need it is because if I put in an image 
I put in a cat. Okay, this guy says it's a cat, but it thinks it's a car more. If this one's definitely clearly a frog, but it doesn't think it's a frog at all. Our machine isn't perfect, so we have a loss function. It's a little feedback loop where we have a prediction function, put in an input, and the correct values, which are labels, into here. It computes how off your machine is, puts it back into the optimizer, and it puts it back in. So it has a constant feedback loop of saying, okay, your machine is wrong, go fix it. So that's what this optimizer right here is for. And so the optimizer, which is what brings the information, puts it back into the predictions. This one we're using is called SGD. It's a gradient descent that is updated over and over again. Don't worry too much about it. Just know that you need to input a learning rate. So the learning rate, the smaller it is, the more precise it is, the bigger it is, the least precise it is. But the more precise it is, the slower it is. So you want to have a little in-between. Don't worry too much about that either. Just find a value that works. Um, that's the optimizer. Once you have that set up, you want to put it into model.compile. Model.compile is the function in TensorFlow that makes it so that training actually gets started. So it initializes the training inside. And once you do that, you just want to put in a few parameters. You put in the optimizer, the loss function. This one is useful for values between 0 and 1. So we're choosing this. And then you have a metric, which is the accuracy. This is the default setting. If you have something specific you're looking for, then you would put it into here. If you want to look for something like speed or anything else, you would put it in the metric section. So what's going on right now is when we're training it for a specific example, we have a value of 7. Right now our machine thinks, OK, this is all the possible outcomes that it is. But the correct value is 1. So when we go back here, um, when we uh, check it out, we go, OK, we need to find a way to get this to be as close to this as possible. That's what we're doing with the training process. Um, now that I've explained that part, I need to go through some logistics with getting the code to work. So we're training in batches. There's about 7,000 images inside of the MS data set. It'd be suicide for your computer to put it all in at once. So we separate it into batches. Um, each batch will be 64, and each train, we'll train it 100 times, just for easy load for your computer. Then this right here is um, we separate it into the training section and a validation step. So you want to validate how accurate your training is. And also, you want to train it at the same time. So we have the, the training batch right here and the test batch. This is how many images we have for the test batch. And I'll talk about the iteration frequency a bit further. So first off, we have the starting code. This is a for loop, just a basic for loop from 0 to how many training batches you want. So we're doing 100 right here. So we're doing all this code inside 100 times. Then we initialize batch. This is new code right here. So new train batch is a method from the MNIST data set. So the MNIST data set provides a class where you input a number, and then it gives you that many images. So you can um, basically say, I want 64 images, next train batch. It will pass back the data for, that, um, for those images. The next thing we have is the validation step right here. So for every five, we set as five. So for however many times the frequency you want, you can check in and say, how accurate is my model right now? So what you would do, you get a, a test batch right here, and then you would reshape the, in, the data from the test batches and put in the correct labels through a validation data array. You're going to use that later on down here for your validation step. <laughs> and finally, model.fit is the value where we actually do actual training. So you want to put in some uh, parameters. Right here, we have a reshaped version of our batches. This is tensor friendly for um, TensorFlow to use. Then we put in the actual answers, the labels. Batch size, which is how many batches, how many images are in each batch, the validation data from up here, then how many times you want to run this entire train loop. Then we uh, process the loss and the accuracy from uh, MNIST data's uh, class information. Now what we want to do is we want to predict what is going on. So we want to put in the value and predict the outcome. So we just trained it. How do we get the right answers? This is the code I used for my little demo just now, the drawing pad. So what we do is we have image data coming from the draw pad. 
We reshape it so that it's friendly with TensorFlow and with the MNIST data set. Then we use the model.predict. We input our data and it comes out with a new output model. In that output model, we can use one of TensorFlow's methods, data sync, turn it into an array, and then add it to a new variable. Once you add it to a variable, all we do here is we look for the max probability and then we return the result. So that's why when I put in an 8, it was able to return an 8. So that was basically it. Hope that was okay. Um, so if you guys got interested in that, what you can do for the next steps, you can go and try it out yourself with the MS data set. <coughs> or if you are interested in actual image recognition with real objects, check out ImageNet. There's like millions of images of everything, uh, everyday objects, cats, dogs, birds, planes, anything you, you can name, millions of images right there for you to train your model in. These are some references I've used. Um, yeah, and this is more information. This is my information again. Uh, thank you guys. If you guys have any more questions, ask me. Um, I would love to talk to you guys if you guys are interested or know more about this. Thank you guys. beginning, uh, you showed like a 28 by 28 and a 28 by 28 matrix and a filter in the middle. I think I know what you're talking about. Give me a second. Right That's here. it. Yeah, where, where is the filter in the code? The filter is, so we don't predefine it. The filter has to do with the activation. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, I understand it's confusing because you want to define which edges you want to detect, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's not in here. Cool. That's all. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, besides images, are there a lot of other public data sets that uh, people can play with? And Sorry. How do you find them? Yeah, in addition to images, is there other huge amounts of data? That there, there are. I've only worked with images myself, okay. but I know there are a lot of data sets you can use. Um, you can use practically anything as data, mm -hmm. but I don't have any public data sets besides images I could recommend. Sorry about that. Another round of applause. Thank you. So, okay, everyone. So, hello, I'm Brandon, and today I'm going to talk to you about computer vision. So, I'm going to introduce myself at first. So, I'm Brandon Guzas. I'm from France. Uh, I'm a former electrical engineer. I specialize in security system uh, when I was studying in France and as soon as I graduated I started working in a security system company in Switzerland where I was mostly spending my days working with a CCTV system for private banking in this kind of place. But one day I decided, I realized that uh, I wanted to know more about the complex system I was installing. So I took the decision to quit my job and I moved in Australia where I resumed my study in the IT field. This is where I had the opportunity to uh, discover, get the introduction about computer vision, what I'm going to talk about you today. And of course, if I'm here today, it's because I enrolled in Code Chrysalis two months ago in my quest of becoming a better software engineer. So, here it is. So, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, at first, I'm going to give you a very broad uh, introduction about what is computer vision and what, uh, what is the application that computer vision can do. And I'm going to give you kind of a broad overview about what is the field nowadays and where, where is it heading. And then I'm going to jump into a more technical side of my presentation. I'm going to walk you through very simple image processing techniques that have been used for decades and are still used today. And then I'm going to go in the convolutional neural network. So luckily, my mate here, Charles, already kind of introduced you about this concept, so hopefully it's going to just be a review for you. And on the end, I'm going to try to uh, explain you a bit the latest state-of-the-art algorithm for object classification, the YOLO algorithm, and I'm going to try to show you a quick live demo on my computer, trying to classify some object. So, I like to start most of my talk with a very simple definition. So there's many different definitions of computer vision. Uh, one, I if, if I have to summarize probably all of them, they are all kind of um, emphasize the fact that uh, computer vision just try to give the same ability to computers and we have with our eyes and our brain. 
So we try to make the computer understand the world around us the same way that we are doing it. So uh, I believe that there is four different steps for uh, computer vision. The first one will be acquiring, then processing, analyzing, and on the end will be understanding what is the picture talking about. So there is many different kind of science involved in computer vision. Uh, of course, we have machine learning section, which is a, a hot topic nowadays. But of course, there is also physics because the optics are involved. We have neurobiology because uh, most of the complex machine learning systems try to mimic the way brain are seeing and uh, interpreting things. So I listed just down there some of the probably most uh, famous uh, applications that computer vision can have in the world around us. And it's just like a very simple list. There is a huge list uh, we can build uh, with plenty of different applications. What is funny to see is actually if we look at this, most of these fields are uh, actually applied in many different uh, sectors of the economy. It can go from military, of course, autonomous driving, medical imagery, uh, retailing, uh, real estate, all these kind of uh, uh, sector of the economy are using some kind of computer vision techniques in their business. So, to explain you a bit uh, how essential computer vision is nowadays, I wrote here some numbers. So the first one we talk about social media, and we have every minute more than 400 hours of video uploaded on YouTube, more than 200,000 pictures uploaded on Instagram and Facebook, and by some some way. All these big companies has to process this, this data. They all have to know what is inside these pictures. They need to know because they have to be sure that this is safe content. They also have to be to know what the data is talking about in order to sell you some advertisement, trying to target the right people on the right uh, video or right picture. So this is one of the cases of computer vision. Another one, it's a very hot trend now for the past few years, is the race for autonomous driving vehicles. The money is flowing from everywhere in this area. Uh, I don't think there is any big car manufacturer in the world who don't have some sort of autom autonomous driving program. Uh, and of course, yeah, the investments are huge in this area. No later than two months ago, or three months ago, SoftBank, again, then invested more than two billion in the General Motors program. Money is really flowing in this area. So what is the problem of computer vision exactly? So if I ask you, like the same way Charles asked you, if I ask you what is this picture, of course you're going to tell me it's a cat, it's black and white, it's walking on the grass, it's very easy for us to analyze this picture. It doesn't take any, uh, we don't have to think twice, it's automatic for us and it's coming very easily. It's like, a, uh, yeah, it's something that we, we, we feel like we're born with. But now, if we put ourselves in the, in the way that computers are seeing pictures, what does the computer see? The only thing it's going to see is just a bunch of array with numbers on, the, on them. Here we have three array because it's a color picture. We have one array for red, one for the green, one for the blue. And that's pretty much it. So if we put ourselves in the position of the computer and we try to understand what is this number means, we we are not able to understand that there is a cut on this picture. So this is the whole challenge of the field, actually, trying to make uh, computers understand the way we see things. So not surprisingly, uh, researchers try to understand at first how a human brain is working to see things. So of course, most of us will think about when we see things, everything is happening in the eye. But the eyes is just the tip of the iceberg. We need, the eyes is pretty much just a sensor like a camera is. All the processing powers is going inside our brain. All, this is where the vision actually happens. And studies show that it's more than half of the brain that is involved in the visual perception of the things. So it's a very complex thing that, that uh, involved a lot of different mechanisms in the brain. So this is what the latest research tried to mimic to make a smart computer vision system. So uh, to try to make you realize how far the uh, computer vision uh, system has been so far, we, uh, we, uh, um, uh, we, try to, to, we try to just uh, 
uh, compare with the human evolution. And so <coughs> when, uh, when we think about the lattice algorithm nowadays, uh, we, have, uh, we believe that the computer vision can do no better than a three-year-old kid. So when I show a three-year-old kid the picture I just show you, like with a cat on it, it automatically will understand and tell you it's a cat on it. And this is something that uh, we, feel, we, we feel that this visual perception is kind of granted for us, but it's actually something very hard to master. That's why so far the best algorithm can match no better than a three or four year old kid. So this research, a very famous research in computer vision, uh, tried to emphasize this by telling that understanding vision is actually trying to understand how we, uh, how uh, intelligence is working. So from now, I'm going to try to uh, explain you. I'm going to jump into a more practical section of my talk. I'm going to try to walk you through very basic image processing techniques. I believe these techniques are very useful and still very up to date nowadays. Uh, they, are, they, uh, they, are, they are used to do some pre-processing. Uh, it's a pre-processing task to do uh, before more complex things such as machine learning and image classification. So in the case of edge detection, what is, in, what is uh, the purpose of this? Imagine we have just a simple picture, a color picture. When we do edge detection, we just try to keep the essential data of this picture. So uh, what the edge detector will try to do, it, it will try to understand, uh, it will try to match the pixel, the sudden change of intensity in the pixel in the picture. And the output of this will simply be a picture with just the edge appearing. And this, is, this, uh, this process can be used in many different uh, areas where we don't need all this data. This is a heavy picture. This is a very light picture, but the meaning of the, of the picture is still there. So there is many different kind of uh, edge detector. I believe there's probably a dozen of them. One of the most famous is the Sobel op operator, the one I choose to explain you and to walk you through the process of it. Uh, the process involved here is very interesting because uh, even for convolutional neural network or other image processing techniques, the process and the, and the technique used is pretty much the same for all of them. So imagine we have a simple picture. It's a black and white picture. It's very obvious for us. We have one edge, we have one, one side of the picture with darker than the other side. So we can, we can clearly see there is an edge on the right on the middle of this picture. But the computer doesn't see this. We need to teach him. So what we're going to use for teaching the computer this, using the Sobel operator, we just need two filters. One filter will be in charge of just detecting vertical edge, the X filter, and the other one will be in charge of detecting Y filter. So how is this going to work? It's pretty simple. We, we're going to do some convolution, like uh, Charles explained a bit earlier. We're going to take the first filter, let's say the X filter, and we're going to just put it on the top left corner of the image. And we're going to do some very simple math using this, or this uh, filter. We're going to do some convolution. So what this will do is, for, e for every pixel unit, we're going to multiply to the corresponding uh, filter uh, value. So the output of this will simply be quite long operation, but very simple mathematics. So it's going to be minus 1 times 100, 0 times 100. And we're going to do this. And the output of this will be a single, single number. This single number, we're going to store it inside a new array. So we're going to keep going like this. So we're going to do some conversion throughout all the pixels of the, of the initial picture. And we're going to do again this. So in this case, we're going to do uh, the next value. And and this time, the filter will detect an edge. So we ha the value we have as output will be different from zero. And we keep going on this. We're going to do this for the X filter and the Y filter. So the output of this will be two, two simple array. So what we have to do right now is just to try to combine these both arrays together. Even though in this case, the Y gradient, the one who's in charge of detecting horizontal edge, didn't detect anything, we, in, some, in some cases, we might have both detection on both, uh, on both uh, array. So we have to do a simple mathematic operation just in order to combine them all together and be sure that the output of this is a positive number. So the final array would be this, and we are pretty much it. This is almost the end of the, of the processing. We just need to decide the threshold. 
So in this case, if you want to be sure that uh, it detects the edge, we just say like maybe all the value in this array over uh, 150, they are white pixel, and all the while all the other value are black pixel. So the output will simply be this. It's a very simple operation that we have to do for edge detection, and the output can be very valuable for uh, further processing uh, uh, techniques. So now I'm going to try to walk you through another very interesting algorithm, the one used to do face detection. I'm talking about detection here, not recognition. This is the technique used before you do face recognition. You, are, you have at first, of course, to detect face. So there is a uh, face detection algorithm that has been, has been around for probably more than 50 years now. But for a long time, it was very uh, not accurate. Lots of false positive was coming out of this. And in 2001, two guys, Violet and Jones, came up with a very smart way to do uh, face detection. This way are still very used nowadays to do uh, in many of our systems. If you take a normal camera, you might see a red square in, in a, or surrounding the, the face of the people. This is most of the time the viral algorithm used. So of course, after this time, we had more probably more accurate uh, algorithm to do a face detection. But viral agent is so uh, efficient, it doesn't take so much processing power that it makes it still very used nowadays. That's why it's the one I decided to, to just explain you today. So like the previous one, it's everything. Uh, we're going to use some filters for the face detection. So what the filter will look for is for a common pattern for every face. So the, the guy, the, these two guys, Viola Jones, just uh, realized that if you look at the face, we can see some pattern in the face, some uh, things that we can find in pretty much all the faces. So they kind of like decided to rule about this face, uh, about this pattern that we can find in the, in the, in the face, and they kind of try to uh, do some filter operation filter detection checking on this on different area of a picture to see if a face were, were present. So how do they do this? They use four kind of filters. And they're gonna they're gonna try to to uh, position this filter in a different in different area of the picture in order to detect a face. So how this is working in an example. So we take a simple uh, common face pattern. The first one that the face the viral joint algorithm will look for. So we, we have this common face pattern, but we know that the eyes region is supposed to be darker than the upper cheek. So we take this first, this filter here, and we just pass it, and we just pass it throughout the, throughout the, the, the image, and we just, just look for place, uh, for light place surrounded by dark place. And if we have a match on this place, we just go to the next pattern. So this is a cascading way of doing, of doing this. So, the, so the, next, the next one would be, for instance, uh, from the previous array you just checked. You go a little bit higher, and you check if there is a darker place on, on the top and a lighter place on, on, the, on the bottom. And if the check is, is good, we keep going like this. And we check many different patterns on the area we are checking. And if one is not good, the algorithm will just give up and keep going throughout the picture. But if we can reach the last uh, common face pattern, so this means the algorithm detects successfully a face. And this is pretty much how the Violet Jones algorithm is working. So, so now I'm going to try to uh, walk you through uh, the convolutional neural network. Uh, luckily, Charles already kind of uh, explained you uh, roughly how things are working. So I'm going to try to uh, give you a broad understanding <coughs> for image classification uh, problem. So, at first, what is deep learning? What is a convolution, convolutional neural network? Like I told you in the beginning, these techniques are inspired from uh, neurobiology. <coughs> Some studies show that a uh, specific part of the brain, specific uh, bunch of neurons, are always uh, triggered depending on the, on the shape you are, you are seeing in, 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 your visual, uh, in your vision. So, it means like if you, for instance, um, if you watch a triangle, a very specific part of your brain will be fired, always. And now if you change the shape to a square, it's another part of the brain will be, will be triggered. 
And what the convolutional neural network tries to do is pretty much the same thing. It tries to trigger uh, some uh, specific filter depending on the shape you are watching or the shape you are scanning through the picture. So, so the convolutional neural network will focus on a very common pattern of, uh, of the picture of the, of the class object you're trying to, uh, to classify. So why is, uh, is it more efficient than others? It's not, uh, the convolutional neural network is not sensitive to image distortion or uh, probably darker dark image where, very, where shadow is very, uh, is very present in the picture. Or if, for instance, if you try to detect a cat who has a hat on his face. So in this case, uh, the convolutional neural, neural network will probably still detect the cat, even though it's not a convo convolutional uh, common cat. It's uh, something a bit special. So before we can do some classification, like Charles explained, we need to do some training. So I'm not going to go through uh, what is the step of the training. I'm just going to try to explain you the broad picture for this. So basically, you you give the system, uh, you give your, ma your your machine learning computer uh, like a bunch of of uh, of classified picture. Meaning, like if we're talking about cat again, we give them like a thousand picture of cat, and the and the computer by training will try to understand what is the common feature we find in this cat. So this feature will be a very tiny feature. So it might be like just a color, just an edge, just a, just a texture. It might not make so much sense for us. But for the computer, these features are very valuable. This is what, is what makes a cat in this case. So this computer will, will understand what, uh, what all the features are common for the cat to make a detection of is there a cat in this picture or not. So, very early on, in 2007, people in Stanford University in a computer vision lab, they understood that they needed a lot of data to do this. So they started this big project uh, asking people from all around the world to classify more than 15 million images. So manually just labeling images like, oh, I see, pe I see a cat in this picture, I see a cat in dog in this picture. So, uh, it's thanks to this kind of huge data set that nowadays we can build very competitive uh, image classifier, object classifier, classifi classifier for our convolutional neural network. So if we take an example, in this case I'm going to give a cat, I'm going to use a mouse. So we say we have a mouse, we, we, want, to, we want to be sure this picture holds a mouse. So the co the the convolutional neural networks already know what, uh, what a mouse is made of. So in this case, we, we have a feature which, uh, which is just an edge, edge of the back of the mouse. So what the computer will try to do, it will try to, and this, to see if this feature is present inside the picture. So what is it going to do? It's going to do some convolution. So it's going to take this filter, this, uh, this very small patterns that we can find, that we can find in, in a mouse, and it's going to do some uh, basic input, basic uh, uh, mathematical uh, uh, computation on the every item, of, on the every position of the, of the array, of the initial picture, with the initial pixel value. The output of this will be the first hidden layer. So how this is working exactly? So we have here, we're just scanning through the whole picture, and we just reach the part where the, the back of the mouse is actually present. So we have our feature here. So we can see clearly here we have the edge that we're trying to detect. So pretty much like we did with the Sobel operator, we're just going to superpose both of these plates and we're going to multiply the number. So that means that if we have both a big value on, either on the filter and on the initial pixel value, we're going to have a very high output number. In this case, we could say that the filter activate, uh, activated correctly. Now, if we're looking for a place where we don't have this shape, the output will be totally different because the high number, the high number we can find here won't match the same number that we have here. And the output number will be very low in this case. So the filter will, won't be activated. So what we do with convolutional neural network, we repeat this process over and over and over again different layer, and so every time 
every time you do a conversion, you kind of down sample the output of the uh, uh, of the initial initial um, uh, pixel size. So every time it's getting bigger, and every time the feature you try to look inside is a bigger feature. Initially we started with an edge, maybe later we're going to go with a full nose or a full ear of a mouse. So this is what uh, the computer do, does when it does many hidden uh, layer. It tries to look for bigger and bigger edge. And what it does in the end, when it has like a a whole bunch of output filters, some of them activated, some of them are not activated because it didn't detect uh, uh, a cat while it was uh, in, the, in the mouse picture. Uh, what we have is just a fully connected layer. And the whole purpose of this layer is just to match all the filter was activated. And the label that this filter has, like uh, if we were talking about a mouse, probably in the end we would have probably maybe eight or nine filter of the mouse activated and maybe just one of the cat activated. So the role of the fully connected layer is just to make a prediction and tells you that, oh, I believe that this picture, is, I'm 90% sure that this picture holds the mouse and only 10% sure it holds the cat. So this is what the whole purpose of the fully connected layer. So now I'm going to I'm going to explain you one of the latest uh, algorithms, one of the most efficient existing nowadays for object classification. It's called YOLO algorithm. So um, YOLO stands this time for you only look once. So it's a kind of a smarter way to uh, do some, uh, some deep learning in a, in a picture. So what the, what the YOLO algorithm will do is pretty simple. We take, for instance, a simple picture. We, have, we try maybe to detect the cat, uh, sorry, a dog, a bike, and maybe some scenes on the background. So what the yellow algorithm will do, it will start doing some uh, pre-processing technique before doing some classification. What it's going to do, it's going to divide this picture in, di in different cells. And it's going to ask the computer, please, inside of each of these cells, can you try to uh, determine, can you try to detect object on it? I'm trying to detect, I'm saying detect, not classify. Just try to draw bounding box ar around every object you can find inside this picture. So the output will be something like this. And what is good with, this, with a computer, the computer will also tell you how sure it, he is that this computer, uh, that, this, uh, that this bounding box holds something. So the next step will be just to uh, discard all the uh, bounding box that is not very sure that there is something like it. So the output will be something like this. We have less. We, we're going to have. We're going to start to have less bounding box, and on every of these bounding box, uh, the computer will start doing some basic image classification like we just previously did. So the computer won't have to look throughout the whole picture, trying uh, trying to do some brute force uh, detection on all the pixel of the picture. And the output of this will simply be uh, just the classification that he will be 100%. It will, it will be. Uh, quite sure about. In this case, we, we don't have probably three match, which is bike, dog, and car. So I'm going to try to uh, uh, show you a live demo of this uh, algorithm uh, with my computer. So I use some. Uh, um, I use some implementation of the Yolo algorithm I could find on GitHub. Uh, we're kind of very busy inside this immersive crew, so I didn't implement anything by myself. So this uh, implementation uses Pytor PyTorch uh, <coughs> machine learning library. Uh, it's trained on the Coco dataset, so it means like you can detect up to 80 different classes. So I brought some objects here, and we're going to see if uh, it's going to detect everything. So we have some, for instance, we have a bottle that takes it correctly. We have a cap. Okay. So unfortunately, my camera is not very good, and my computer doesn't do very well with uh, graphic. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, we got scissors. Okay. We have a cup. Remote? No. Cut. <laughs> Pen? 
it has more than 80 different class on this, so of course it's not perfect. <laughs> okay, I know this example wouldn't be that impressive, that's why I put a video. If you go on the Yolo website, uh, the Darknet website is a place where the, uh, the guy who, who implemented this algorithm uh, uh, hosts all this uh, uh, algorithm. You can have this beautiful uh, demo of how fast this algorithm can work. So this, so this, uh, uh, this video was processed with a very normal, uh, with a very normal computer using probably a high-end graphic card, and this is a live, uh, this is a real-time processing. So it could, this the real force of this algorithm is just to detect a very fast object. It's much much faster than previous model. This is the whole purpose of this one. But of course, it's not 100% 100% accurate, as you can see, there is some mistake. But it's still very, very fast. So, to summarize, if you would like to start about computer vision, I would highly recommend to do some uh, image processing uh, techniques like the one I explained you. There's probably a dozen of different image processing is pretty much the same thing that you can find in your Instagram filter. You can implement them by yourself. It's not that complicated. And I highly recommend you open CV to do this kind of uh, uh, test and try to learn a bit more of this. Of course, you have other library. You have MATLAB as well, if you want to reach, of course. And of course, you have a, uh, you can go a little bit further and try to implement some uh, uh, object classification like I just showed you, like the Euro algorithm using some some of the machine learning algorithm available nowadays. So okay, so here's some of the reference I, I use for this talk. So as I can as I told you the Darknet project is uh, this guy PJ Reed is the <coughs> one who came out with this Euro ID algorithm. Uh, if you want to know a bit more about uh, object classification, this guy has a very nice introduction of it. And of course, you have the ImageNet.org. There's many different websites online who allows you to compete with each other to uh, just uh, try to uh, design the best algorithm to do uh, the best classification. And that's it. Once again, similar question. Do you, uh, the slide that showed two two okay. square grids and it reduced and it found the edge. It was very near the beginning. And it mapped to that edge detector. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm when so, you so the thing is. You come with a filter mm -hmm. and you do some convolution. Mm -hmm. Convolution is a process that is very used in computer vision. So you take the filter, you just superpose with the original image array mm -hmm. with all the pixel value on it, and you just multiply the value of corresponding case. And you just add them all together. If you just look at here, here you can see it's, you have the minus one here mm -hmm. times 100. You have zero times, you have the zero here times 100. Mm -hmm. You have the one times fifty, and you do this for all the all the places of the people. And it's, it seems like you're you're eventually you're reducing this down to the probability of something existing or not. Of edge existing. Okay, or not. I see. Cool. Thank you. Any more question? Yes. This, this probably comes down to mainly opinion, but uh, but uh, what sort of things do you think that you cannot uh, solve with deep learning? Well, uh, Are there any? Well, there is a lot that you cannot solve nowadays, but uh, like the object classification, this field is kind of booming, and the progress we made throughout the past few years is huge. So I believe, I want to hope, that someday we, we can, with deep learning, achieve uh, probably more than we can achieve with our own brain, especially for uh, visual processing. Okay. 
Any more questions? Awesome, okay. another round of applause. the application with Unity and I will I'm really happy to share this topic because virtual reality is fantastic. So let me start. First I will introduce myself. I'm Toru Eguchi from Tokyo. And first thing I want to tell is I really love technologies. I think it's easy to understand. And and I researched virtual reality for my master thesis yeah, when I was a university student. And I will explain it later. And after that, I joined KDDI as a server engineer, especially uh, Google Cloud Platform and also AWS. And uh, what I did was uh, designing the architecture of IP infrastructure. But uh, it was really challenging and interesting. But also, I felt like bored because what I want to do is not designing. What I want to do is building something. So uh, now I'm here called Chrysalis. It's really nice. And uh, in called Chrysalis, I'm called Launchmaster because I have my own tablet in a uh, smartphone. And uh, I have, I think, 20, yeah, more than 20 spots only in Roppongi. So if you want to know a good restaurant, yeah, let me know. And uh, I will use a uh, cat picture, and I don't use dog picture. So if you like dog, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, as I said, uh, I was a VR researcher, and uh, my topic was if elderly can actually run in virtual reality, what happens? Yeah, it's kind of a crazy topic. And what I did was I put a VR device and also motion capture to elderly, and I made them to run in virtual reality. It's kind of yeah, crazy, but it was good, really nice research. And, but unfortunately, Two months ago, uh, I found Oculus. This is Oculus, <laughs> the most famous uh, VR device. It was uh, carefully packed over there, and no one touches it. So I felt, oh my god, no one uses VR anymore. And uh, here I want to ask you guys: uh, Does anyone have used uh, VR? Oh, so much. It's different from my expectation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I asked the same question to call people in Call of Chrysalis. Have you ever used uh, virtual reality? And many people say, like, no, and no, and no, and no. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay, okay, okay. So, why not? talk about virtual reality uh, for my TED talk. That's why I chose uh, virtual reality. And today's contents is, first one is what is virtual reality. And second one is what are the qualities <coughs> of virtual reality. And third one is how to start making a virtual reality application from today. And if you know Unity, Actually, it's easy to understand, but I try to explain well. Yes, and first one is what is virtual reality? Is it like something really funny? Or is it related to dystopia? Yes, some people say, you know, if you dive into virtual reality, you never go back to real, real environment or something like that. I will give a good definition. Uh, virtual reality <coughs> is interactive computer generated environment taking place in computer environment. Here, the important thing is it's taking place in computer environment. 
it means the ratio of information is like this. Digital information and real information is like 9 to 10. And okay. some people may know augmented reality. And AR is an interactive experience of real world where the experience is augmented by computer-generated information. And the most famous application is, I think, Pokemon Go. And the uh, uh, ratio of information, digital information, and real information is like 1 to 9. So if you compare with uh, VR and AR, it's more, yeah easier to understand and so how about mixed reality uh, does anyone know mixed reality yes it's in between yeah between virtual reality and uh, AR and uh, the most famous uh, device is Microsoft HoloLens and if you use it you can see this kind of thing you know, it's kind of mix of digital information and also real information. And in summary, it's like this. It's a spectrum. Virtual reality is highly based on digital information. On the other hand, AR is based on real information. And mixed reality is in between. And some people use the term XR, that XR includes everything, MR, AR, ER. That's really simple word. And next topic is what are the qualities of virtual reality? First one is immersion. Maybe some people yeah, have heard this term, immersion. Uh, if you use virtual reality, uh, you can dive into different world. You feel you are in different world. That's kind of sense of immersion. And if you use uh, this immersion wheel, uh, yeah, let me give you an example. This is really simple 2D game. But if you play this kind of 2D game, you never feel you are in this game. You just play, right? And this is 3D game, uh, it's PS, PS4, and, but if you play yeah, this one, I think you don't think you are in game, but if you use virtual reality, it's completely different. If you use virtual reality, you feel you are in game, that's sense of immersion. And uh, entertainment use virtual reality well. Yeah, it's easy to understand. Uh, if you play a VR shooting game, what you feel is not like this. Not like I'm playing a game. Uh, you feel I'm shooting a gun. That's also a sense of immersion. And uh, this feeling, uh, makes people feel really exciting. So that's why entertainment use virtual reality. And also some people use uh, VR for travel. And so why? It's like this. Uh, let's say one girl, I want to see the Grand Canyon, but it's expensive. So as a travel agency, how do you do? What do you do? Maybe some people just show the picture of Grand Canyon, but <laughs> I think it's not enough to describe Grand Canyon. She cannot understand how Grand Canyon is big. So it's time to use virtual reality. If you show Grand Canyon in virtual reality, uh, she can easily understand how Grand Canyon big. How? The Grand Canyon is big. And the second uh, quality yeah, aspect of virtual reality is 
virtual reality makes everything possible with low cost. So it's because virtual reality runs on computers. You can do anything, of course, because it's virtual reality. If you want to do time travel, of course you can do. And yeah, that's good. A uh, good case, medical training. Uh, some people now use uh, virtual real reality to the uh, medical field. Uh, it's really difficult for doctors to practice surgery because if you practice to real person and if you fail, that patient died. So you cannot do such things. So it's time to use virtual reality. And also interior design. Uh, this is a case of IKEA. Uh, they tried to use virtual reality for uh, showcase uh, because if you want to use real furniture to show uh, furniture, uh, it's, it costs a lot. But if you use virtual reality, it's super easy. If you make you know, digital information, everyone can use it. So, now you know well about virtual reality. Let's review virtual reality, AR, and R. And virtual reality is highly based upon digital information. On the other hand, AR <coughs> is based on real information. And mixed reality is in between. And all it is, yeah, immersion. You can feel you are in different world. And also, it makes everything possible. That's two aspects of uh, virtual reality. So next, okay, I know. Uh, I know you know what virtual reality is, but how to make how to start making a virtual reality application. And you can start it from the day actually. And, <coughs> and let's make an action game with cardboard. I think eh, not everyone knows. Cardboard is yeah like this one. Super cheap. It costs like ten dollars, and if you choose good one, it's maybe like three dollars. And uh, what you need one more is smartphone. I think everyone has not everyone, but almost everyone has smart <laughs> smartphone. So it means you can start virtual reality from today. And uh, there are three steps to make virtual reality application. First one is set up a uh, dev environment, and also there is special configuration of virtual reality in Unity. And also, I will give you some design tips of virtual reality apps. I know setting up a uh, dev environment is really harsh, but <laughs> you, I think you can do. And first thing you need for development is game engine. It's, uh, it's software which has many components you need when you make a game. And <coughs> currently Unity and Unreal Engine is, I think, the most popular game engine. And the characteristics of them are Unity, it's originally for individual de developers, and Unreal Engine is for consumer game. And so it means Unity is good at mobile app. And also, Unreal Engine is, it has nice graphic because it's for consumer game. And Unity covers many uh, VR hardware, but actually Unreal Engine also covers many uh, hardware. So you can choose both actually. But today I will explain with Unity 
because it's mobile app. And uh, what you need to prepare is like Java de development kit and also Android SDK. And if <coughs> this is not necessary, but if you have Google VR SDK, it speeds up, speed up your development. And also Google Cardboard. And if you use Android, uh, you should enable USB debugging mode. And uh, I don't explain detail because there are so many websites how to install Unity, how to install uh, JDK, and also Android SDK. So, next one is a special configuration of virtual reality for Unity. And, yeah, I can show you guys, like here. <coughs> This is a UI of the yeah, first UI of Unity, and if you want to make new project, you can just hit new, and right here, let's say, oh, awesome VR, oh, awesome VR, and if you create project, it takes like 10 seconds to make project but and yeah here this is uh, the UI of unity yeah there is not nothing of course like this but normally uh, here This is called scene, and uh, this is called game. And this game uh, actually show what users see. And for example, if you create, oh, if you create cube like this, uh, you can see cube here. And if you want to move, you can move like this. And if you want to make virtual reality application, uh, just hit file and build the settings. And there is a uh, configura <coughs> configuration of which platform do you want to build. And uh, the default setting is first PC. So, and I want to make it on Android. So just switch platform. And there is player setting here. And uh, the cool thing of Unity is if you want to start virtual reality, there is XR setting. And here, virtual reality supported. And if you want to make yeah, virtual reality application, just click here. And if you want to make it with cardboard, uh, add cardboard. That's it. So you can make a uh, virtual reality application from here. It's super easy. And yeah, I made, uh, actually, uh, what I did is only two steps, switch platform, and also make check mark on virtual reality support. But what does virtual reality support mean? It means two things. First one is all VR rendering to head mount display its device. And oh, second one is all head tracking. And first one is when you make application on Android, of course it has only one display, right? But uh, if you make click, on virtual reality support, it split display into two. And also, <coughs> head tracking. If you want to, uh, if you want to do head tracking by yourself, you have to write code, get sensor information from smartphone, and also uh, reflect that data to camera. It takes a lot, but if you make 
check mark. Yeah, Unity will do everything. And so, yeah, that's finished configuration of virtual reality setting in Unity. But I think it's too sad to <laughs> finish this section. So, <coughs> so how I will explain how to speed up your development of virtual reality. Uh, first thing you can do is yeah, use public asset. Uh, in Unity, there is asset store, and it sells many components. And today, I will use uh, the three dungeon. I don't know how to <laughs> how to pronounce, but maybe dungeon, mm -hmm. dungeon, <laughs> and fantasy monster and skybox. And if what? and here. I already imported that uh, those three assets, and I didn't do anything. But here, so if you use asset well, he, first I want to change uh, sky of virtual reality environment, and there is lighting setting here, and if you change lighting. To this one, yeah, it makes big, huge change, and there is a field here, and if you put field here, yeah, now you can see field, and also you have sky already, and for action game. You need skeleton, not zombie. And <laughs> there is which one? Yes. Skeleton is here. Like this one. But now it's super small. So let's make it bigger. Like this. So yeah now. It looks really nice. If you use asset well, yeah, you can make uh, application really fast. <coughs> whoa, whoa. And, and one more thing. Uh, as I said, if you use Google uh, VR SDK for Unity, it speed up your uh, development also. And it contains editor, emulator for Unity, and also it contains gaze cursor and gaze input system. You can download it from here. And so, what is editor emulator? But now, if I play this game, like this, I cannot move, you know. I cannot move from here. But of course, for virtual reality, uh, user move you know their head like this, and we need that kind of simulator. But in in Google VR SDK, there is nice tool, and I already imported Google VR SDK, and in Google VR SDK there is. <coughs> Uh, ZVR editor simu simulator, and it can yeah. If you use uh, that asset, uh, you can simulate users input actually. That's really nice. And only you have to do is just make empty object and move main camera to that object. And also, this ZVR editor simulator should be children of uh, camera container, yeah, empty object. So now, if I play, I can do this kind of thing now. Without this ZVR uh, simulator, 
uh, when you want to check something, you have to build on Android. But it takes like one one minute. Yeah, of course it depends on what application you make, but this speed up definitely speed up your development. And if you add character animation and game system and 3D effect here, I will show you the demo. And this one. Wow, this is virtual reality. And here, this is welcome scene. And if you go start, Wow, there are so many skeletons. <laughs> wow. And if you want to kill, you can kill like this. Wait. <laughs> like this. And there's skeleton here. And if you get damage, it's like this. <laughs> My life is maybe only four. So if you get four damages, Game over. That's it. <laughs> yeah, animation and game system and 3D effect. <laughs> yeah, it's big. <laughs> yeah, many, but okay. And next one is three design tips to make a virtual reality application. First one is please avoid motion sickness. This is the most important point. Uh, if you cannot avoid motion sickness, you cannot make virtual reality application. And second one is make user feel familiar with virtual reality because uh, many people doesn't have experience of virtual reality. So this is important. And third one is make user look around. It's for fun. As I said, virtual reality easily cause uh, motion sickness. It's super easy. So you should be careful about it. So uh, why motion sickness happens? Uh, it's because of uh, mismatches between physical and visual cues. So it's roller coaster. And if you play a roller coaster game in virtual reality, your eye think, okay, it goes right. But on the other hand, your body doesn't move, of course. So this mismatch goes uh, motion sickness really easily. And how to avoid motion sickness? It's uh, one tip is please never stop head tracking. This is the most important point. And if you freeze your head tracking one second, it causes motion sickness, even for one second. So, and also, you should be careful of smartphone performance because smartphone doesn't have super power. Yeah. And the bad case is if you instantiate many objects in one scene, and if you do not destroy object in proper timing, yeah, your smartphone performance decrease. And uh, let me show you a quick demo. And uh, yeah, this one. And if I play this one, this is kind of extreme version of my game, but it has many skeletons like this. If you do this kind of thing, uh, you know, smartphone performance is not enough to, to process those things. And yeah, oh, it's not so slow now, but if I play for like 10 seconds, oh, yeah. 
it's bit, it's not smooth enough, I think. And there are so many skeletons <laughs> here. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. Now it's really slow, right? So if you do this kind of thing, yeah, so bad. But of course, this is super ex yeah, extreme case. But you should be careful. And next one is yeah, good case. Good case is yeah. Well, instantiate the proper numbers of object and destroy unnecessary object in proper timing. Like this, if you kill, if user kill uh, skeleton, you should destroy object. And also, one tip for motion sickness is please use constant velocity. So, as I said, this is roller coaster. And roller coaster has acceleration and also deceleration. So, it causes motion sickness super easily. So, but this means normally roller coaster in virtual reality is horrible. If you play for like for one minute, you can understand. Yeah. yeah but if you don't have acceleration, how do you move in virtual reality? There are two solutions. First one is just stop user's motion. This is super easy, but not so good. And next one is use scaleboard. If you use scaleboard, yeah. No acceleration and deceleration. And okay, next tip is make user feel familiar with virtual reality. As I said, many people doesn't many people don't have experience of virtual reality. So it's like this. But case is like this. Wow. It's <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah. This is the yeah, but case, and if you want to avoid this kind of thing, uh, yeah, how to make user feel familiar with virtual reality. Uh, first thing you can do is just do not start application automatically. Yeah, like my application, my app has welcome scene, and if you have welcome scene, user can you know, get ready for virtual reality. And also, uh, yeah, you should allow the user to start your application, not you. And yeah, it's, let's see, it's more easy. Uh, this is my application. And now, if I Way here. This is bad case. If user play your game, it automatically start game. This is not so good. User cannot get ready for virtual reality. And good case. Whoa. Okay. Good case is just prepare a uh, welcome scene like this. If user start to play your application, and nothing happened, and the user can, you know, <coughs> user can play around here, and if you if user play around with virtual reality, they know okay, this is how to uh, play with virtual reality or something like that. <coughs> And just start. User should start your application. Cool. And uh, one more thing is give feedback if user do something. Yeah, it's quite straightforward. If user kill a uh, skeleton, you should make some kind of uh, 3D effect. Uh, it's really easy to mix the yeah, effect. So, uh, 
so far, what I explained is for just for a good user experience. But now it's time to make your application a bit fun. And yeah, how to do it is just make user look around virtual reality environment. Because if you like this. Wow, you can make a surprise if you make user look, look around. For example, uh, if user see here, this side, and if you render some scary thing like ghost, and if user look back, and they, you can make surprise easily. Yeah, that's one, one simple tip. And if you start uh, if you start making a virtual reality application today, you can be master of virtual reality. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> That's my presentation. Cool. Any questions for Toru? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. Oh, um, uh, are there any like medications that would help with motion sickness? Medication? Yeah. Uh, you mean during playing? Like something to drink. What happens if you do VR development just in case you get the motion sickness? <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah. If you like, if you are not healthy, uh, if user is not healthy, of course. You should stop using it to play virtual reality. And uh, also, if you feel some motion sickness during playing virtual reality, you should run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that's really simple solution. But if you move your body, yeah, it makes you feel better. Yeah, maybe if you. Uh, <coughs> if you see some articles, maybe it says different thing. But my solution is just run. <laughs> Low tech solution. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, another round of applause. Okay, uh, hi guys, my name is Denam Kim. Um, today I want to talk about the mini blockchain. Uh, today, you know, actually, I want to talk about the blockchain itself, and um, I'm going to introduce a really small blockchain app you can run on your own web browser. Is there anybody who doesn't know about what blockchain is? No? Yeah, everyone knows. First about me, um, I'm a major in electronics engineering, yes, and I major in I embedded system design in, in master's degree, and uh, because I'm really interested in it, uh, designing and building up the embedded system. So I actually build up the, like a full law, a full leg law bus or some Bomberman game player or Tetris players. And um, yeah, of course, I worked at a really uh, quite big company in, in Korea, is building up the cooking jar, but it was not so good for me. So I changed my tech careers to the web tech. And so, so that's why I came here. And I worked in uh, software companies in the past by uh, nine years, uh, so now I'm here to find out better opportunity for the future. Okay, is the outline of this presentation is blockchain, of course. The first block is about uh, blockchain itself, and the second block is will uh, play with a real demo app. If you have a laptop, and then you can access later. So, uh, so many keywords about blockchains today. So, but uh, I want to concentrate on just a few things: the blockchain and block and proof of work and transaction. These really small things. And blockchain is invented uh, by the Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008 uh, for the cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin. Uh, but I don't know. And actually, she did build up the blockchain, but it doesn't matter. But is working on the world, and so I think it's changing the world, you know, ecosystems, whatever. So is already is blockchain is, is now 
growing so fast and can be applied to the many different kind of fields and not just only finance, banking, and even healthcare and the IoT field. And most of uh, famous popular is crypto and blockchain technology is Bitcoin and Ethereum. And um, here is the component of blockchain. First, we should think about the transaction because it's really important things. And second is block. Transaction should be installed, uh, stored in the block, and the block will be into the chain. It is a blockchain. And later on, we're gonna save the whole chain into the node. It's kind of our desktop or some your phone or server, wherever. Finally, we can connect between all the nodes. Share the whole chain, the entire network, and the synchronize all the chains. So today, I want to talk about just four blocks here. Just simply. The what, why do we need a blockchain? It's a really serious question. Because as I mentioned already, it's creditable and verifiable transaction. Because our world is working on transaction. If I send some money to somebody, and that must be verified and creditable. If the transaction is not verified and creditable, we're not gonna trade something, we're never gonna believe, trust anybody in the world. So it's case study for the supply chain. And uh, here is just working on the real world as, as of now. And uh, maybe you know, you're gonna work on the, some software development company. And uh, we could see so many uh, different kind of systems. Retailer, or the manufacturer, or logistics and distributor, and uh, even uh, the wholesalers. And they are operating on their own system with specific database. And then they need to maintain the whole systems. So even the, the multiple sources and the human errors is because we could add some transaction data and then they can be error because this, we are human. And also the fraudulence and um, vulnerability and the cracker attack the server or some kind of security issues, and then data, whole data will disappear. And then nobody knows what will happen. And then even the higher cost, because maintain the whole services, and uh, check it out, all the data, okay, uh, is the manufacturer created something, or send something to the logistics company, but logistics company have to find out is it really right things from the database. And the wholesalers and have each, uh, and each their database and checked up all the things. Is this actually valid data or not? It's really cost. So, but uh, when we block, when we use blockchain, we could share everything into the single chain, as I mentioned already, and the single source, and then all the detection human error by the consensus. But uh, I'm not going to talk about the consensus today. But it's a really important part, and also security is really. A, Hard. I mean, uh, it's actually impossible to uh, kind of attack some specific data into the chain, uh, into the block, because whole block is connected and also depend on the previous block. And then it's the biggest part of the blockchain, and uh, this intermediation to reduce cost. So if they share their own blockchain database, the entire network, they don't need to think about the whole database. How can we? operate our database or failure because then every node is connected to each other like this it's pure to pure network and then so it's uh, so many benefits of using blockchain single source and early detection consensus by consensus and secure and it is to verify and um, it's maybe business leaders will think about this kind of things cost reducing cost so, talk about the blockchain itself. Blockchain is just block and chain. It's really simple, like this. Block means data, and chain means hash, simply. So this block has data and previous hash and current hash. It's a timeline, and some new blocks added here, one by one. And then each block is just have a relationship between two blocks. This current hash will be passed to the next block. The next block will take the, this hash as previous hash. So if there's something changed in this block, and then later on we can validate 
that is actually right or not. It's really important. So when we train the hashes, we use the SHA-256. Uh, but I don't know, it's just, I, I didn't research this academic stuff. But you can find out through the Wikipedia. And so there's a lot of SH2 series there. And uh, the reason that we use the transaction is this is a real world. This real world is just so we can find out. So for example, here's a bank. We can send some money to Bob. And Bob will know, oh, yeah, Alice sent me that money. And then also Alice, oh, yeah, the money is actually cheap to my friend Bob because there's a bank. When the digital transaction is uh, easily copied and then uh, or some remove or some send more money and then actually there's no evidence maybe in a letter on the Alice is cheated on some transaction and even some, some people can hijack data so we can call it the digital ledger to solve the issues and Alice send uh, the money to the bar and then the transaction history will be uh, saved into a ledger, digital ledger. And the digital ledger also shared with other, other people, and we can call it non. For example, the biggest problem of the transaction is the double spending problem. This buyer is send a Bitcoin to the seller A and seller B. But it just the buyer has just one coin as of now, but he send the two people the same coin is to who will receive the money and then actually this is a real problem but uh, when we use the digital and centralized decentralized ledger and then we can fix and we can solve the issues actually because there is a solution for I don't know we can solve it by the consensus and, but as I mentioned already we are not going to talk about the consensus but by using consensus these kind of problems can be solved easily. So we can rely on this blockchain to verify our data. Also, we need the digital signature because this data must be secure. And then, but if I send there is send some money or something, it's kind of transaction happened in the network, but the receiver is actually this data is actually valid and the transaction itself, not blockchain now. So we need to create new digital signature when we send new, uh, when we create new uh, transaction and hazard with them and, um, and we're gonna use the private key to sign the whole transaction and then send it to my uh, receiver and the receiver will uh, decrypt, uh, decrypt the old data with using the, my public key and then finally, we can validate that data is actually verified or not. Here is some transaction sample code. The transaction is, in this case, is, I'm, I just made this really simple transaction. And there is from address and to address and amount and signature. A signature part will be, I'll talk about it later. And here's the hash. It's SHA in the 256 algorithm will take everything as a string and from address and to address and even amount and then just return it and here is the signing transaction and then yeah we got already hash you know previous page and then yeah i use the sign and we using uh, i'm sorry um, i'm gonna sign the all the transaction uh i don't know transaction by using the private key and all things is a kind of including process but today I'm not, I'm not I'm not gonna talk about the base 64 or the DR including rules that everything is uh, you can find out it through the Wikipedia it's really specific and detailed information there and the signature will be saved in the this dot signature and everything is signed and it have the original data and hash and sign. These things will be saved here and then receiver can validate the transaction and even in the blockchain. So we should validate signing 
because you know, receiver need to find out if the data is actually actually true or not. So uh, the transition has the original data and then signature inside transition like this. This is all original data and the signature. And then we using the public key, we can like, decrypt this data just to you know, extract the hash data from the signed value. And then just compare two data and hash transaction and the signature in the transaction is equal, then will be validated. Here is source code. And uh, its value function is to check out some address and signature. But the most impor part, important part is here. And so from address, it make a new public key. It's because from address is as you, uh, used for the public key. And uh, the public key will be used to verify here. As I mentioned already, the calculate hash here, and here is the signature. And if they same, it's written true. And then now we're going to talk about the blob. And blob is has uh, holding the batches of the transactions, and then including cryptographic hashes already that to show the code. And uh, also we need to use proof of work to create a new blob. Like this, uh, is it blockchain? Is it the blocks? And all the blocks is uh, created by uh, the shop two five six hash it here, and then this one will be passed to the next block. And next block will be used this this one. And next block will also use this. Uh, all things will be new create new hash here, like this, and. Uh, in order to create new blocks, we can call it mining. And mining is not actual mining. It's an actually, it's kind of really hard to uh, take the new block. It's really computa computational work. So this is mining in blockchain. It's create new block. It's really time consuming there because they need to find a new proof of work. So here is mining core. And um, first, I set the reward transaction because the miner should have, I uh, should receive the uh, the reward because they use their resource and they deserve to take rewards. So I uh, reward transaction and to edit pending transaction. In my block is maybe I could send some money or receive some money, whatever. And so I can save the many transactions is in my in my computer, and then. So it's pending transactions here. So when you set the block and with the transaction and the latest block. Latest block means and no. Yeah, here is previous previous block the hash. In order to take the previous block the hash, you're gonna send a new block. And then here is mining. It's really time-consuming part if we use um, really big difficulty and it's going to be really problem because uh, the proof of work is just check the number of zero in the hash number randomly. So the hash is generated by random logic. So of course there is a specific and uh, algorithms there, but yeah. So it's really time-consuming. So we need to set uh, difficult as smaller. Than as we can, so you know, in the first time. So it's just a mining block logic. Now it's difficulty, and it's nonce. Nonce is just used for the new hash, because the you know, hash created every every time, in every in the, every try here in the loop, and just change some data and then create a new hash code. And then the so difficult is I, I mentioned the length of zero, and then is it. It's same length of zero is in the hashy, and then they can say it's mine. Like this. It's every time, every single time, they create new hashes here. And the calculate hashes uh, is there. This is proof of work. Everything is will be save this this dot hash. Oh, where is it? This dot hash. 
and then previous hashes will refer the blocks previous hash, and uh, this transaction will be uh, string five to make the new hashes here. It's really simple logic. Okay. Uh, how many blocks is now in the Bitcoin and Ethereum? And uh, have you ever thought about that? So many blocks. Yeah. As, as I mentioned, the blockchain is, uh, came out uh, from the, uh, to the world in 2008. Uh, but I searched out um, this site, and um, it's over 550,000. Uh, this is really, really smaller than the Ethereum. Ethereum is 10 times bigger than the blockchain and the Bitcoin. Uh, it's because you know, there is some algorithm in the Bitcoin. Bitcoin has create, uh, it can create new blocks every 10, time, every 10 minutes. And also, the block, I know Bitcoin is designed for the payment system only. But uh, Ethereum is designed for uh, the computation, computational things. For example, not just only for the payment system, or in many different kinds of transitions can work on the track at Ethereum. So Ethereum also can create new blocks in every 10 seconds. And also, there's an automatic you know, difficulty adjustment inside the logic. So, Bitcoin is getting harder and harder to take the new block, but Ethereum is flexibly take the new blocks. So that's why it's, uh, Ethereum's block is 10 times bigger than block and Bitcoin. Okay, now it's a uh, play demo, and uh, if guys have a laptop, oh, doesn't have anyone? Okay. <coughs> this, this is URL, and I'm gonna show you the demo from now on. It's really simple blockchain app. Okay. Anyone want to access it here? No? Please yeah, don't access wait, the wait, wait. sort of the mobile phone <laughs> I didn't use. No, okay. Okay. <laughs> but design will be broken because I didn't use the great system for the mobile phone. And then, yeah, later on I will fix that. Here is my blockchain app. It's simple work, uh, working on browser. Yeah, uh, when we log in here, and so just Genesis block will be created automatically. And there's nothing, it's, uh, it's really empty stuff. And um, yeah, Genesis, Genesis block is nothing, transaction. And also, I don't have any coins because I didn't, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't mine any blocks. And then I'm gonna add new blocks here. Yes. And I got 100 coins. And when I see this, it's so, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be rich. It's so, so many people try mine, yeah, blocks and every day using computational power. And there's empty block, but um, as you can see, uh, the hash is um, depending on the previous one. This previous hash is this block's hash. And this block's hash will be. Yeah, this previous this block the previous hash, so it's connected the whole of blocks in the chain. And here is a uh, transaction information because I mined new block, I got ten hundred I don't know hundred points for my reward. Here it is, and the uh, firm address is still no address because uh, the blockchain system gave me a hundred coins, and then also I'm gonna add some. Um, is there anybody who want to receive my coin? <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Tagai. Tagai? Is it right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but, uh, and then actually in the real world, uh, I need to add the public key to the true address. But this for demo, uh, yeah, I don't have that one. Okay, you gave me the name, I'm gonna give you 200 coins. That'll be fun. And then this pending transaction. And um, before we uh, and the before we add this penny transition to the block, and then I can delete it. Okay, let's see. don't worry about. It. I'm gonna give you two hundred points again. And here is the penny transition. I'm gonna make a new block here. 
Yeah. And then this red one is just uh, is a negative number from my account. So I sent my 200 coins to Tagai and I received uh, 100 coins again for my new block. So inside the transaction, we can see uh, some information here. Uh, yeah, Tagai, and I, I gave him 200 coins, and here is uh, I received 100 coins. And then, if somebody tried to change this block to be rich, for example, like this. I want to be rich. Okay. More? Okay. <laughs> Yay. But some um, block doesn't work like this. Entire block chain is not valid to be read. Also, which block is not valid is here. This block is broken. So this chain uh, must be rubbish because it's nothing. Uh, because it's cheated. <coughs> and then so I'm going to make it back on the coins yeah everything is working out yeah this is my blockchain demo app and um, yeah as you can see oh also here is another information um, maybe after later on is you can access the URL and then you can see the public key and private key and everything is will be saved into your local storage of your browser, not an actual real database. So if you want to remove here and just Chrome browser and application here and local storage and you can remove everything later on. Also we can use the set the difficulty. Uh, as I mentioned the difficulty is really serious uh, parameter. And the two is enough. But if I uh, make uh, if I set the five or six, and then we need uh, six number of zeros, uh, digit, six digits of number, uh, zero, you're gonna be really, really uh, time consuming and computation. We need more computational power. For example, if I add this, it's not, yeah, it's working on. And also, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and you can, as you can see is um, CPU will take uh, this Chrome browser will take the CPU 100% uh, is maybe in a minute is my laptop will be burned out so I should stop right now So <coughs> we need to set the difficulty too. And then after you're testing, you want to delete everyone inside in this app, just click here and everything will be deleted simply. Okay, thank you for coming today. I, and I hope you enjoy uh, the primitive stuff in blockchain with my app. Okay, thank you. chance that the another chain that longer than the original chains. Oh uh, you mean consensus? Yeah, like kind of that. Oh uh, and actually in this app is there's no any logic for the consensus. And and actually first time I tried to uh, connect the actual peer-to-peer -peer network and um, so I wanna show the actual consensus consensus process but it was, I didn't have enough time so I, I just made it simple. Making uh, people right. understand, but in any real case, like in Bitcoin, yeah, of course, yeah. right? Like if there are the another chains, like longer than the original chain, yeah, it, longest and value chain will be accepted. The anti, yeah, anti the, the longer chain will be accepted. Yeah, yeah, even value. But but it's like it's kind of we kind of fake chain, and there may be some people like they're fraud, and mm -hmm. there may be some fraud, and they will take money from it. Oh, uh, the anti chains. I'm not so familiar with the 
really really specific things of Bitcoin or some blockchain stuff. I, I'm just you know very first beginner and to understand. And then and in this presentation, I just show you what I learn and and then actually I made this app from the scratch to understand what blockchain is. And then even um, yeah, it's consensus things can be answered by is there is really super genius and crypto guys there called Dylan. Dylan can will answer will we'll answer answer you later. Sorry. Any other questions? So please don't scurry away. I want to capture everyone. Um, there are some snacks and drinks on that table over there. Please help yourself. Um, and uh, please make a friend. I don't like going to meetups where people just come, watch, and then leave. Um, if you guys can make a friend while you're here, add someone on Facebook, follow someone on Twitter, add Code Crystals on Instagram. Um, please do that. Uh, and yeah, thank you all so much.